Today on the Wrestling Roundtable, the Montreal Screwjob and Submission Round 5 Q&A. What the fuck is Wrestling Roundtable? Welcome back to the Wrestling Roundtable. I'm the host, Eric Santa Maria. I've been in wrestling a little over seven years, and I've been watching 22. I'm the host, like I said, sitting to my left, which is your right, Will Evan Brooks. He's been a fan of 22 years. And to my right, which is your left, Rodney Lacant. Been a fan of 22 years also. And once again, joining our panel, Grizzly Redwood. Been wrestling six years, but you've been watching 16. And today we're going to talk about the Montreal Screwjob. Obviously, one of the big topics that we haven't gotten to yet that we've covered in our fourth season, and I know a lot of people have been waiting for it, so here it is. And if you're a younger fan, you want to find out what really happened. It's essentially, Bret Hart was WWF champion in 1997. He had a 20-year contract he signed the year before. Vince McMahon said he was suffering from financial duress. He couldn't afford to pay him anymore, and he offered him out of his contract to renegotiate with WCW for a deal that he would have had a year before had he actually left. WCW said, sure, we'll take him, and we'll pay him a lot of money, but the big problem is he was WF champion. Vince wanted him to drop the belt to Shawn Michaels on the way out, and it's covered in the great, greatest rivalries Blu-ray that just came out and we checked out. The deal was that Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart did not get along. And it seemed to me that Vince is the type that likes to stir up shit, especially if you read Bret Hart's book, he saw that he was doing the same thing with Bret and Hogan in 93. He seemed to like to create this drama backstage to really amp up the on-screen drama, and it worked, because it ended up being that they butted heads on and off camera, and it just became a big issue with those two. Michaels wouldn't lose to Bret Hart, Bret Hart felt disrespected and wouldn't do the same, and part of his contract was he had reasonable creative control which means he could veto ideas if he wanted to, really, and that's what he did. They put, and they were two heels at the time, too, which was also very different. And I think a lot of Survivor Series 97 was sold on the fact that we know these guys really hate each other in real life, because what other time did they headline a pay-per-view with two heels fighting each other? So in this case, he didn't want to drop the belt to Shawn Michaels in Canada, his home country. He'd lose it to anybody else, even if it was the next day, but not Shawn Michaels. So Vince decided, all right, nothing else is working. I'm not gonna do this sort of thing where Bret Hart puts someone else over or vacates the belt on the way out. It has to be Shawn Michaels that night, and so they screwed him. On pay-per-view, TV, whatever you wanna call it, this was the most real thing that ever happened in wrestling. And I know there's a lot of conspiracy people out there who still think it was a work. I don't give any credence to that. For the sake of having a good conversation about what really happened, we'll talk about that maybe on the website. You can sign up for a message board or something. So. At the end of the day, the big question right off the bat, and it's the big one, who was right and who was wrong? When you look at it from a broad perspective, you'll say that Vince and Sean were wrong because Bret Hart has had a lot of years in the company. He was always a company man, going on the road 300 plus days a year, wrestling hurt, sick, never the type of guy to really try to pull political power backstage. So for him to not honor Bret and try to cater to what he felt Bret would want to do, yeah, it's wrong, especially doing that to Bret Hart on pay-per-view in Canada to Shawn Michaels. Of all people. Yes, yeah. of all people, yes, that was wrong. But if you want to be the employer, if you were the boss, then that was the right thing to do. That might have been the only thing to do. You have to look at it. Are you the worker or are you the boss? If you're the boss, if you're the head of a company and you're more relatable than Vince McMahon, then you might think different. Then you might say, if an employee doesn't want to do anything, then you might send them off in a way that they might not agree with. Remember, we watched DVD, was it Vince's or Sean's, it was really Helmsley that really put the idea of their heads to do that to Brett. Like any another reason to hate Triple H. But in this situation, I think everybody was wrong. Vince McMahon should have put himself in that situation to begin with. Shawn Michaels was wrong because he was just a piece of shit. Like he said, he wouldn't pull jobs on anybody else. So from Bret Hart's perspective, why would I want to pull a job for that guy? If he hadn't have said that, maybe the situation wouldn't have happened. And Bret Hart was wrong too, because yes, it's a home country. If you're in America, does that mean Stone Cold should want to lose because he's in America or Shawn Michaels? I mean, it wasn't like it was in Calgary. Calgary, I can understand, because that's his home city. But... Oh, it's still Montreal. It was still no, I understand. I understand. It's just, I think, 
he was wrong in that sense too, but I think in that situation, everybody was wrong. Everybody had a point, but everybody was wrong. I don't think, not just morally, but legally, that Vince was right. Because I think that's probably why there wasn't a lawsuit involved with this, because he really, not just the fact that he screwed him on pay-per-view and ruined his stock going to another company, he violated their contract. That might be why he never filed for assault with the punch backstage afterwards, because then it would come out, he violated the contract in terms of the creative clause. He came up with so many different scenarios going in before that, and no, none of them were good enough. It had to be that exact thing. So let's see what the wrestler thinks. All right. You're from a wrestler's perspective. As Rodney was saying, maybe a promoter would think differently, but what does a wrestler right. think? Right. Uh, you're saying, like, legally, Vince McMahon was right. Well, legally, also. No, legally, he was wrong. Wrong, right. And legally, also, Bret Hart was well past the amount of dates he was covered. Yeah, so he, he wasn't covered any more dates. Mm -hmm. On the same hand, all right, you have one year after a 20 year contract, they're like, we're letting you out. Mm -hmm. It kind of makes sense to me because a 20 year contract in anything, let alone pro wrestling, just yeah. sounds like very idiotic no matter what it's still, it's still, like, it's still, you know, they're going, yeah, for, they're going for a ratings fight or whatever. It just seems very dumb. Mm -hmm. Right Hart got treated a little poorly that way and they definitely could have came up with a better scenario. Everybody could have resolved it better. In the long run though, it sure as hell helped Vince's business overall, didn't it? Clearly. So, uh, does that make him right? Not, not morally, but I guess business-wise, Vince made a great decision. I guess if that's your bottom yeah. line, and you may be right, maybe I was wrong about the legal part because Bret Hart was working past the he date was. that he was supposed to be there. But that's a key thing, the date, because Bret Hart was not allowed to be on WCW before December 5th. Mm -hmm. And that means the earliest Nitro he could have been on was December 8th. It was around that time. It wasn't eight months later or whatever Michael Hayes said on their yeah. Legends of Wrestling show. That was ridiculous. Six months? It wasn't even six weeks. But anyway, point being, WCW put Bret Hart on. Now, a lot of people say they couldn't legally even bring the belt on the air because of some sort of copyright thing. Now, of course, we remember when Flair brought the big gold belt, there was a lawsuit there. They eventually blurred the belt and substituted the Intercontinental underneath it, no less. But then, again, they did have Medusa drop the women's title in the trash, too. That's leading into the next question because that's the image that keeps being replayed with the Monday Night Wars. And... Bret Hart, they were saying, we don't want Bret Hart to show up on Nitro and drop the belt in the garbage. I don't think Bret Hart would have done that myself. But how much of a factor did WCW itself play in this? Because you don't hear that talked about at all. And I don't mean directly, but I mean in the sense that WCW and them bearing down on WWF not only made Vince McMahon go back on his 20-year contract because he couldn't afford it anymore, we're getting our ass kicked, whatever, but it made him paranoid to the point that he wouldn't even trust Bret Hart of all people, how much factor do you think that really was in this whole thing? I think it wasn't about trusting Bret Hart, it was about trusting Eric Bischoff. Well, he, he didn't yeah. trust Eric Bischoff. Bret Hart's not in his personality type to go out and do that. But Eric Bischoff, he knew that would maybe eventually get in Bret Hart's ear and say, listen, we have to do this. He knew that to have the WWF chance show up on Nitro would definitely bring so much stock to WCW and so much attention and bring down the credibility of Vince's main prize. I think that was really the main concern of Vince. And he was losing the Monday Night Wars, they were losing battle to WCW that was still hot, and to get Bret Hart on top of it, Vince McMahon would have lost a lot. But again, I keep going back to I don't think that's in Bret Hart's character. Even it's if you not, but it's Bischoff. But it was yes, Bischoff. even if you can't trust Eric Bischoff, which of course you couldn't, couldn't you at least think that Bret Hart at the end of the day would be like, no, sorry, I'm not doing No, you can't. So many people have burned Vince McMahon, and the Hogan testified against Vince McMahon. Hogan, all right? In wrestling, it's really hard to trust anybody. Yeah, true. Um, WCW was 100% the deciding factor. If WCW wasn't there, everything would have been resolved completely differently. Mm -hmm. Probably wouldn't have gave you Bret Hart a 20-year contract to keep him there. So he wouldn't have had to go back on it. So he wouldn't have had to be like, we're letting you out of this contract. I think it was the huge deciding factor. The whole reason behind the whole thing. It's the same reason that they paid Jeff Jarrett a huge amount of money in 99 to drop the Intercontinental Belt to China on pay-per-view, yeah. just so he wouldn't go to WCW. Like, could you imagine that happening now with TNA? That would never happen now. They so, wouldn't even care. Okay, speaking of not even caring though, back to the, the WCW factor, let's suppose that Bret Hart had dropped the belt in the trash at Nitro. Wouldn't history have just played out the exact same way anyway? Wouldn't it have even been that big of a difference? It would have been a huge difference. What's the difference? 
It's Bret Hart. He's taking their belt in the middle of a war between like well, both t- like companies are neck and neck with each other. So like both he drops the belt in the trash. That's the end of the war. I don't. No, it's not the end of the war, but it's a huge. It's like a seesaw. Like, tips completely in WWE's favor. Okay, but I'm saying okay, WWE looks bad for a week. So what? He's been bad for a week. Looks been bad for a while because that means you have to go back and come up with a new champion, find out a way to make it interesting to why fans would want to tune in. Why am I going to tune in so they don't even have a champion? Okay, but I'm over there. They the Bret Hart. They have their champion and their champion. They, they would have had a champion. They wouldn't have just been like, oh, the belt's gone. We got no. no but champion. They, yeah, but they had to come up with something. So they would have always had that one up, and that would have yes. killed Vince McMahon. That would have killed his ego. But by the time WrestleMania came around, a few doesn't months matter. Later, it's like, one. It's one week. It's one week. It was as long as WCW still has that up. Ah, but we got your champion. It's always going to eat for the McMahon. Plus, yeah, look at the promos by Hart. McMahon is the most attention to detail. That would kill. Bret Hart could cut those quick killer promos like I'm still a champion. Who's that guy? He's nothing. He didn't beat me. I am the champion. Here's the bell. It's sitting right here. You're giving WCW way too much yeah. credit to do something creative. Okay, yeah, creative, but like yeah, okay. Yeah, but they're not. They didn't have the creative direction to use well, I mean, it properly. It's all one. Of, it's all big one. But when you when, so. you when you lose in the ratings battle, you can't think that. Well, they're not going to do it. You yeah, can't. You can't take that. You risk. can't underestimate yeah, WCW. You can't under a company that came up with the whole NWO thing and turning Bischoff into an on-screen character. You can't. Underestimate a company, You're like right? That. And I don't mean to take a cheap shot at WCW as far as the creative stuff. They had a lot of great stuff, but at, that, at that time, you can't underestimate. But generally, them. not for Bret Hart, as we saw. But, we, but we, had, we had the belt, though. Right? But they didn't yeah, know. They turned, right Hogan. they turned Hogan heel. Who knows what they would have done with Bret? Well, we'll talk some more about Bret Hart and the Montreal Screwjob when we come right back. Acclaimed by reviewers and film festivals around the world, it is one of the great documentary films of our time. Now, the 10th anniversary collector's edition of Hitman Heart, Wrestling with Shadows. The story of the epic real-life battle between Bret Hart and Vince McMahon. And as a special offer never before released on DVD, The Life and Death of Owen Hart. Exclusively available on this double DVD 10th anniversary collector's edition. The Life and Death of Owen Hart. The story of a real-life tragedy in a world where making money trumps everything. Vince McMahon has always had this mentality about treating wrestlers like circus animals. You never, never dreamed something like that could happen in wrestling. Order the 10th anniversary collector's edition of Hitman Heart, Wrestling with Shadows, and the life and death of Owen Hart. And you will also receive two added features. A new interview with Bret Hart, looking back 10 years later, and an interview with the film's director, Paul Jay. Order this double DVD set now for only $24.95. Order now online or by phone at 866-396-4231. $24.95 plus shipping and handling. Order now. It's all work. It's all good. I still think it is. Everything it's we just talked work. about makes it not a work. Whatever. It's not a work. Whatever. You got a little heated there, right? It's, it's not a work. Yeah, but I was laughing about the other day. Think about Martin Kent coming out like Tisha Kent oh. with the Martin theme song. That would have been the <laughs> Just because you talk like Joe Pesci, it's not because you're tough like him, man. <laughs> oh. You swing a bat like him. It's a little shot. Okay. It's cool, man. Is it? What did you write? The what? I didn't do that. That's what the mean that I gave him. Semi? What are you talking about? Semi made of it? Welcome back to the Wrestling Roundtable. Join us on all our social networking sites. We are on Twitter, we have two pages on Facebook, and you can get the links to all that, including YouTube, which you're probably watching anyway, but all the links to all our different sites. Don't just stay on YouTube, people. We've got a lot of other things going on. WrestlingRoundtable.com is where you can get all of that. Joining the panel to my left, which is your right, Brett, screwed Brett, no, Brett Midge Simonello, who's been a fan of 25 years. Joining Orlando O'Neill to my right, which is your left. Orlando, a fan of 20 years, and we were just talking about the Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels incident with the Montreal Screwjob. Although really, what happened? Although I'm really more focused on Vince McMahon and his involvement. And we just checked out the Greatest Rivalries documentary a few weeks ago, Rodney, and it was really interesting seeing what their perspectives on the whole incident were now all these years later. Imagine if Vince was in the middle of that, what he could have added to that. It would have been really interesting. And it was great to see, though. But we're asking some different questions that might have been covered on that documentary. And one of the first ones I wanted to ask was, after Bret Hart got screwed out of the title, 
essentially the whole Hart Foundation, what was left of it, left along with him. Jim Neidhart a few weeks later. British Bulldog was already off TV. I think he was injured. Well, actually, he may have wrestled on that yeah, survivor circuit, but he had a knee injury at the time, so he was kind of liable, and they let him go anyway. So they let three out of four of the Hart Foundation go. Owen Hart stayed, though. And it seemed like for a few weeks at least when he would show up once in a while, like he attacked Shawn Michaels at the end of DX in your house, people were really behind him because that was the whole scenario. Everyone felt, no matter how much spin he put on the time-honored tradition and all that other bullshit afterwards on TV, Mr. McMahon was spawned out of this incident for right or wrong, and he went on to good things with it. But the fans were behind Bret Hart. They sympathized with him, and when Owen attacked Shawn, it was really cool. People were into it, like, yes, Owen's in the right, and the nugget, and all that other bullshit. Didn't really go anywhere after that. But even taking away the hindsight is 2020 idea, just the idea that this guy's gone, his family, for the most part, has gone with him. Do you think they should have let Owen Hart go, too? At the time, no. Why not? I wouldn't have. You lost Brett, but now you have this really hot angle that's placed on your lap. Why not keep at least a piece of that mm -hmm. for yourself to make business and make money? I would have done the same thing, keep an own off TV, just to kind of give him a steer. It's like, where does the Hart Foundation stand? You see Brett on TV, but you don't know where Owen is. And I would have done more with Owen, but I definitely would have kept him. But why him and not Bulldog and Nightheart too? Because he's Brett's brother. I would have taken Owen off. I would have let Owen go out of his contract, I would have let him do anything he had to do, because during those last couple months, Owen didn't really look like himself on TV, even with the whole Austin thing, and I know when he came back, he came back to a lot of fanfare after his brother got screwed, but mm -hmm. I think they should have just let Owen get out of his contract, because he didn't look like he was into wrestling anymore. Well, he wasn't. Yeah. It's also... So could have used him for it, one. Fine, yeah. but it's also a working environment sort of thing, too. Like, it well, is, but... I would comfortable would he feel? He probably would have made more money working in WCW because they were throwing money like like nothing. Right. And he was ready to get out of the wrestling business to be with his family. That's what I don't get about this Earl Hebner thing. Because everyone always says, I sympathize with Earl, it's okay, I understand. He needed the job, he needed money, whatever the fuck. You're telling me WCW wouldn't have snatched him up in a second? They would have taken anybody from WWF. Yeah. He would have had a job, I think. So what do you think, Owen stays? From a business standpoint, Rodney's right. Owen's your money maker and you don't just let him go to WCW and make the money there. However, Vince talks about the relationship with Bret Hart and how he feels bad that everything. If he really did feel that way, feel so strongly with their relationship, he would have let him go as a show of good faith. He got what he wanted. He got his title. He did the whole screw job, which made the whole McMahon character. He got what he wanted. He didn't need Owen for his bottom line. As a small olive branch. Right, sorry. as a show of good faith saying, look, I understand what I did to you was horrible. Here's your brother. You guys go live a happy life. Do what you want to do. I'm sorry. Here you go. Because Owen was pretty much there just for the money. He didn't really mm -hmm. care about yeah, wrestling yeah. so much anymore. He just did it for the income. But something else that happened after Survivor Series, which was off camera and kind of interesting, at least that was the rumor. A lot of you think that the internet wasn't around in 97. It was. And one of the big talks was the locker room and their reaction. Because you can imagine what they felt about this. Yeah. Guys who had been around and loyal for a long time, like Undertaker, probably were like, what the fuck? This was major fucked up bullshit. And it seemed like that was the rumor, that everyone the next night on Raw or whatever was yeah, gonna- walk out. Yeah, if they were gonna protest this. And it didn't really happen. I think a lot of people were under the impression Foley was the only one. Now, I'm gonna ask whether they were right to go on as business as usual, because it is their jobs and whatever. But aren't there strength in numbers? Wasn't this the only time, really, that there could have possibly been a chance for a wrestler's union? Yeah, I mean, that was probably the only time, but still, it's business as usual with wrestling. If they're gonna continue wrestling a show after a wrestler dies, then, then they're gonna continue wrestling a show after somebody gets fired. Well, you know? that happened a couple years later. There wasn't a precedent oh, yeah, for it yet, that. but it ended up proving you right. And that's I, I think that being under the right leadership, such as someone like Undertaker, who is a general in the locker room, the WWF lockout at the time, could have happened, it could have been possible. I think they should have been together, not only against Vince, but against Sean, because 20 guys turned against one of your other top guys and basically did something that we looked down upon in the wrestling business. And especially in the Monday Night War when everything was against WCW, like we talked about the fact there was in the previous segment, well, can Vince forget about affording whether he can get the belt dropped in the garbage or not? Can he afford to have his roster not show up for a fucking show on a Monday night when they were about to have their biggest pay-per-view ever with Hogan and Sting? 
Do you think that the locker room should have shown more solidarity or did they do the right thing? Absolutely not. The locker room should not have walked out on their own jobs for one reason. Hitman wasn't out of work. He was going to another company to make more money than most of the locker room. But it wasn't by choice. He had a job. They weren't protesting anything. There was no point to get across. They weren't protesting for the hitman to get his job back. He wasn't on the street, not able to feed his family. He was going to buy a bigger house. It sucked the way he left, but what does that mean to the locker room? Nothing for their dinner table. They gotta do what they gotta do. Yeah. Bret Hart was in a better situation. It happened in a shitty way. Maybe a monetary situation. But financially, he was fine, and there was no reason for them to risk their jobs for somebody that's gonna have a job in a month. Okay, but I said this might have been the only point in history where wrestlers could have had a union if they had formed together for this. Well, what about the idea of Vince's in financial straits, can't afford to lose a Monday night? He could have lost his whole fucking company. Imagine the leverage they would have had if we said we're not gonna show up on Monday night. They practically might have been done. WCW could have practically swept in and bought WF. The situation as it is today could have possibly been completely reversed, but... Yeah, let's look at how the WF treated the WCW wrestlers once they took over. It could have been pretty bad. Yeah, but I've joked on the show before, WCW always put over WF wrestlers when they brought them. That's the thing that was based on. No, yeah. Let's put yourself in Vince McMahon's shoes, though, just as we did with the Owen Hart show when we talked about that. So you're the promoter here, you're Vince McMahon. Going into Survivor Series, do you do exact... I was... <laughs> do you do exactly what Vince McMahon did in the same way, or do you try to come up with something going into this to avoid the whole thing? What do you do? Going into it, I would have avoided it. Especially with Bret Hart. I mean, I mean maybe I'm biased because that's my favorite wrestler of all time, mm -hmm. but this would have been the last thing I would have wanted. Bret has done so much for the company and for a company guy, and just knowing the backstage beef with him and Shawn Michaels, I would have went about it a different way. Maybe I would have done something to lead up to a Monday night dropping the belt from Brad to Sean, but I wouldn't have done it. If I was in Fritz's shoes at that time, I wouldn't have screwed Brad like that. Monday morning quarterback. It's easy to say that when it's not your money and it's not your company. How do you know this wasn't Vince's last resort? He might have had planned. I think through. it's been well documented. It yeah, was, it pretty much was. Yeah, so he tried. He didn't want this to happen. Bret Hart was stubborn, he didn't want to drop the belt. This is Vince's company. Like I said before, Bret Hart was going to be well off on Monday night. He was going to have his job and going to have his money. You got to take care of number one. And number one to Vince. Oh, was yeah, I mean, as an employer, yeah. You could see if Vince McMahon wasn't completely in the wrong, but if it was me, my morals, I would have done something. I know it's easy to say it in retrospect, but even going into it, at the time, we knew Bret Hart's contract was expiring. That was well known going into it. In fact, on the pre-show, I think it was Michael Cole who just debuted with the company still there, Michael Cole, but whatever. He was interviewing Vince because this was on the preview show, and he said, who is going to win tonight? Backstage, yeah. Right. And Vince was like, I don't know. That's just really playing up on what we knew going into it that, wait a minute, Going to WCW, contract, what the hell's going on? Yeah, the chant. very unbalanced yeah. night. Right, so we knew going into it, there was a good time frame, not just if you're backstage talking with Brett and Vince or whatever. So we kind of knew. So I never understood why, especially because they were two heels, like I mentioned in the previous segment. Going into it, the Bad Blood pay-per-view wasn't the Hell in a Cell match between Undertaker and the European champion at the time, Shawn Michaels. The winner gets Bret Hart in Survivor Series. Why not have Undertaker win it? It's easy, just delay Kane's debut for I another month. I totally switched it up. Okay. Like, if I was Vince McMahon, Vince had pretty much two months to build to get the title off of Brett. He had two months and he waited till the last minute. Mm -hmm. What I would have done at the September pay-per-view, Sean and Undertaker, the uh, draw, whatever it was, and no contest, that was going to be the number one match yeah. at Ground Zero. So for the October pay-per-view, triple threat. Brett, Sean, and Undertaker. Could they have done that in Montreal also? No. I like it better in okay. October. Yeah. Undertaker beats Brett. Undertaker gets his win back, Sean and Taker gets to wrestle at Survivor Series, and Brett wrestles Stone Cold at Survivor Series, and he puts Stone Cold over. Does he put Stone Cold over? Does Stone yeah. Cold exist at this point? Because Mr. McMahon certainly doesn't. Austin won the Intercontinental yeah. belt. But you didn't but want to take away the thing from him and Owen. Oh, no, no, no. I, I, I would have had... Uh, but I'm saying the Stone Cold Steve Austin, the guy who we know who got his made majority of popularity by going against the boss. If you want to talk about retrospect, are you going to give up Mr. McMahon and that whole attitude error? Because... Well, they didn't really know that was going to happen up until the last of the Montreal. Now that we know. They were already putting McMahon and Austin together in September, way before that. 
that. So I don't know if it's necessarily one cancels out the other. But like I was saying about it, if Undertaker was in there, we know Brett has no problem with him. Yeah, Undertaker man. wins the belt, Kane shows up, because yeah. that had been built up all year. You change the focus away from the guys leaving from WCW to this new angle. Well, yeah. would you also risk, I mean, Brett and Sean is something that people have been waiting to see again since WrestleMania 12, and since Brett came back, They've been hinting that these two are going to fight again, and they both went through character changes. And even watching it, I could really tell that like these guys really kind of hate each other because they were saying things to each other that normally that guys don't. Say. I mean, they weren't even building to a match. Yeah, but if and the, they had promos going if the only other. outcome of a Bret and Sean match is going to be a screw job, then I'm not sure if that's the best thing for the business. I mean, you really just have to look at what it's going to happen after that in the forthcoming months. Yeah. Well, they did try doing that at King of the Ring that year, and it didn't work out because of that big brawl they got backstage. Mm -hmm. But to wrap up the talk on Montreal before we move on to the Q&A, I just wanted to point out one of the things that I love about the Montreal Screwjob the most, and it's really not much, but what I love about it is that it really exposes the soul of Vince McMahon, that deep down, he's just an old-school carny. you got to remember, this guy is third-generation promoter, and he's it's always had, blood. he's it's in his blood, he's always had that mentality. And this, to happen in 1997, when they're on pay-per-view, cable, to happen in, essentially in the modern era, just really shows how old school Carney he was. Because you know what? It wasn't even the first screw job in Montreal. It happened May 4th, 1931, when Ed Strangler Lewis was screwed out of the title, and it was given to Henry DeGrain in a bullshit disqualification. So... He's carrying on the time-honored tradition. Yeah, dropping the belt before you leave like Stan Hansen did to Vern Gagne. <laughs> but anyway, some more talk on Montreal, I'm sure, underneath the video on YouTube. And it continues on our message board. Sign up on WrestlingRoundTable.com, and maybe we'll follow up on the radio show, too. Right now, though, we're going to go to you. Submission Round 5, next.